Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 17, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears in my eyes, so the Apostle Paul's crying, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach or their appetite. And their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Let me repeat that. Their minds are set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. Can you say amen to that? Our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Heavenly Father, I pray for the next few minutes that you would touch my body, touch my words, anoint them, and make them powerful to change lives. Teach us, Lord, today how to be kingdom citizens that represent your kingdom. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. Today, the Detroit Lions will play the Arizona Cardinals. Now, I saw some imposters over here in the second row wearing San Francisco 49. You're supposed to boo at that, not cheer. But the Lions will not only have to battle against the Arizona Cardinal players, they will have to battle against the Arizona Cardinal fans who will boo them from the time they walk on the field until the time the game is over. But even though they'll be playing in a hostile environment, the Lions coach still expects for his team to win. He expects his team to overcome the hostile environment and still win the game. As we look at our nation today, it's clear that Christians no longer had the home field advantage. There was a day when we were the home team. We were supported in schools, we were supported in governments, we were supported in the culture at large. And even if they didn't agree with us, they still respected us enough to allow our opinions to be heard. But today we are no longer the home team, which means if you are a Christian living for Jesus Christ, not only is the culture not supporting you, they're gonna boo you. And the more committed you are to Jesus Christ, well, the more you're probably going to be booed. You know, if you, if you have uh, a lawn, anybody have a lawn at your house? If you have a lawn, you've probably seen ant hills. These little ants decide to build their kingdom on your lawn so you have to address their presence because they're trying to bring their kingdom to uh, destruct, or you know, to destroy rather, your lawn. And today what we've seen is secularism and humanism and all forms of idolatry have invaded our culture. And God is calling the church not to sit on the sidelines and just sulk. He's called us to get in the game, to play the game well, and ultimately to win the game. That's our calling as Christians. So what I'd like to talk to you about this morning is far bigger a deal than a candidate or a political party. This has to do with your role and my role as Christians in the culture. Now, did you know there's gonna be an election on November 5th? Anybody know that? And on November 6th, whether you are happy or sad about the outcome of that election, I want to tell you, as a Christian, God is calling you to be something that's greater than a Republican or greater than a Democrat. He has called you to be a kingdom citizen, a kingdom independent in the family of God. The Apostle Paul says it like this in verse 20. We just read it. He says that our citizenship is in heaven. Would you say those five words with me? Our citizenship is 
in heaven. God is calling you, if you carry his name, to be a kingdom citizen. What is a kingdom citizen? A kingdom citizen is a visible, verbal follower of Jesus Christ who seeks to bring the perspective of heaven, that kingdom, and deposit them into the concerns, the chaos, and the conflicts of this culture. That's a definition of a kingdom citizen. You know, far too many Christians today are so earthly minded that they are no heavenly good. They know more about Trump than they know about the Trinity. They know more about Biden than they know about the Bible. And some people will even argue and act like secularists while naming the name of Jesus. In fact, if you, if you bring up something from the Bible, they get mad at you, even though you can prove your positions biblically. Because they're so in line with this culture that they have forgotten that this is not their home. Their true citizenship is somewhere else. It's with the Lord. The apostle Peter said it like this in 1 Peter 2 and verse 11. He said, I urge you as aliens and strangers. He says, if you're a Christian, you're an alien and you're a stranger. He says, our citizenship is not first on these shores. We are temporary residents on this earth. And our ultimate allegiance is not to a party, it's to another king in another kingdom located somewhere else. You know, when Paul wrote these words, our citizenship is in heaven, he was writing these words to a church in a city called Philippi. Philippi was located 800 miles from the city of Rome, but it was still part of the Roman Empire. So Paul is making a parallel between Philippi's relationship to Rome and the Christian's citizenship to God's kingdom. And so Paul says, hey, Philippians, even though you are located 800 miles away from Rome, your citizenship is still in Rome. You are still informed by Rome's laws, informed by Rome's customs, by their influence, even though you are 800 miles away. Now, Christians, look, I know that we are a long way from heaven, but our citizenship is connected there, and we are to be informed by heaven's laws, heaven's customs, heaven's influence. Come on, somebody. Like Philippi was impacted by Caesar, we are to be impacted and informed by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have a passport which allows me to go to foreign nations. But when I go to foreign nations, I don't give up my citizenship just because I'm visiting that country. Far too many Christians have surrendered their passports to another kingdom, kingdom, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. I'm not saying you shouldn't be part of a political, of a political party, but you ought to be Democrat light or Republican light. I'm saying don't turn over your passport to them because your ultimate allegiance is to another kingdom, another king named Jesus Christ. Now, we all know that the thermostat sets the temperature in an atmosphere. A thermometer reads the temperature. And God has called us, Dream City, as Christians and as a church to set the thermostat. We're supposed to turn the heat up on the culture. We are not to read the cultural thermometer and adapt to it. Because the culture is now anti-God. Like it or not, we are now living in a post-Christian nation. And yet our coach, Jesus Christ, still expects us to get in the game and to ultimately win the game. I want to tell you, this is no time right now to run home to mama. This is no time to lick our wounds. This is a time for Christians to lovingly and yet boldly and unapologetically stand for the values of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to bring heaven's values where your residence is, your citizenship is, into this realm. That's why God's left us here. He didn't leave us here just to sit and soak and sour. He didn't leave us here, come on, just to go to church on Sundays. He left us here to penetrate the culture with the customs of heaven, another kingdom. Jesus said, my kingdom come, my will be done on earth. And we are the ones who bring that kingdom perspective to this earth. 
Jesus said in Matthew 5, 13, you're the salt of the earth. He said that you are the light of the world. Our job as Christians is to influence and, and infiltrate every sphere of our influence as full-time disciples of Jesus and not just part-time Christians. In other words, everyone in your sphere ought to know where you stand about your citizenship and where your ultimate allegiance lies. Which means, if we're going to do that, some of us are going to have to adjust some things in our lives. We are going to have to adjust some mindsets the way that we live. When I was a, a boy, one of my favorite sitcoms was Different Strokes. Anybody ever seen Different Strokes? That was a funny show. I love that show. And there was these two boys who lived in the ghetto and they were adopted by a rich Park Avenue businessman. Man, they were living large. Like the Jeffersons, they had moved on up. Amen. They were just living large. And, um, but the problem was they were bringing some of their old ways of life into the new environment where they were living. And so they had to rethink things. They had to recalibrate the way they were living for the new environment. Well, you know, some Christians had brought the old way of the world into the new environment of the kingdom. And we have to recalibrate those things because this is not our location anymore. Are you with me? This, this is not our home anymore. That spiritual ghetto is not where we live anymore. Our citizenship is in heaven. We belong to another king who lives in another kingdom. And we are supposed to be getting our instructions, our culture, from the sweet by and by. And not the nasty here and now. This world is no longer to be the definitive influence in our lives or our decision making. You know, when people immigrate to this country legally <laughs> and they want to become citizens, they will lift their hands and say, I pledge allegiance to this flag. What are they saying? They're saying that my, my old home is no longer the dominant sway over me. Far too many Christians are allowing the old life, the old way to have dominant sway over them. And, and that's why when things don't work out in life the way they think they ought to work out, they just lose it. They start fussing and cussing and complaining because they are confused about where their ultimate citizenship lies. I love how the Apostle Paul says it in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Are you still with me out there today? He says, for he, Jesus, has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. So guess what, Christian? You are now part of another kingdom. You are just visiting here. This is your temporary home, and you ought to live that way and treat it that way, which means we should never allow this current age, this earth, to identify us anymore. What do I mean? If someone asks you, are you a Democrat? What you ought to say is, well, what issue are you talking about? Because I'm going to take that issue and lay it against the word of God and tell you if I'm a Democrat on that issue. And if the word of God says differently, I'm not a Democrat on that issue. If someone says, are you a Republican? You ought to say, well, what issue are you talking about? Because I'm going to take that issue and lay it against the word of God and tell you if I'm a Republican right now, because more than being part of a earthly political party, I'm kingdom independent. I'm part of the kingdom of God. I think kingdom on every decision of my life. Now, here's why this is so important. Don't miss this. It's so important for you to do that because we are now the visiting team. And guess what? Both sides of the aisle are going to boo you once you start disagreeing with them when they start disagreeing with your master. It's just simply the truth. Paul complains in verse 19. He, the Bible says he's crying when he says this. He says, he's talking to a church, remember? He says, their mind is set on earthly things. Interpretation? Stop thinking like an earthling. Stop thinking about the old way. 
how you grew up, what your mama said, what your daddy said, what party, what your party thinks. The Bible calls that human wisdom, human wisdom or worldliness, which means you've adopted a way of thinking that is incongruent with a kingdom perspective. Paul says, their mind is set on earthly things. Stop thinking like an earthling. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever bring heaven in on your daily earthly decisions? I hope so. Have you brought heaven in on your decision about who you're voting for? Or do you revert back to earthly things? Which is anti-God thinking. What we need in the church, listen, I know I'm coming on strong today, and I hope that no one gets up and walks out. If you do, I will call you a chicken, amen. Because this is right from the word of God. What we need are Christians who have a kingdom perspective. They leave earthly wisdom behind and attach, tether their lives to a kingdom perspective, which is, where my Bible go? God's word, amen. In, in John chapter 18, Jesus Christ is about to be tried. And Governor Pilate asks him a question, verse 33. He says, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus says in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. So look, if you're, if you're fighting the wrong fights politically, that's not a kingdom fight. We should be involved in politics, but we should adhere to a higher kingdom. But my kingdom is from another place. I love that. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world, notice he came from another world into this world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Okay. Do you know why certain Christians aren't hearing from heaven? They don't want the truth. Jesus said, my kingdom is in this world, or, or, or I'm in this world, but my kingdom is outside of this world. I came into this world to bring the truth. So Jesus is not talking about some obscure pie-in-the-sky kingdom. He's talking about a real kingdom that starts up there but comes into this world. So you and I as followers of Jesus should be talking about that kingdom, representing that kingdom, sucking that kingdom down to this earth to impact the culture. We ought to be defending that kingdom. So as kingdom citizens, our first question on any issue ought to be this. What did God say? What did God say in his word, the Bible? How does God feel? What does God want me to do? And if we don't know the answer, let's not be lazy about it. Let's research, let's read, let's ask questions and study. And when we find out how God feels, guess what? When, when, God, when how God feels contradicts what we think, we're wrong. And God is right. Otherwise, we're just thinking like an earthling. We're thinking like with human wisdom. This past Friday, I had to get up very early, 4.30 in the morning, go down to Sky Harbor Airport, catch a flight to fly to Dallas, Texas to speak at a, a men's conference on Friday night. And uh, I had it all set up, everything was packed, alarm goes off at 4.30, and I had my route all set in my mind how I was gonna drive to the airport. But the last minute I thought, you know, I better, you know, do a, do a map search on this to make sure that I'm taking the correct route. And the map search redirected where I was gonna go and took me a completely different direction. So maps gave me a view from up there and up there changed my decision down here. And it saved me like a half an hour on the trip because there was road construction. In other words, when I heard from up there, it affected what I did down here because up there can see a lot more than I can see down here. Well, guess what? God is way up there. He is high above it all. He has all the answers. He has all the wisdom. And if we'll just touch him and connect with him, he will keep our path straight. And what God says should trump every other decision of our life. 
His word should rule everything because this is not our home. You understand? We're just visitors here. And we are first citizens of heaven. By the way, did you know the Bible says that God is more than willing? He's wanting to give us the wisdom that we need. James 1 and verse 5, the brother of Jesus, James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives it generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. When you ask, you must believe, not doubt, not, not, not believe your way, believe my way. He says, don't doubt it, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. The per that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all their ways. Here's the problem. We have too many double-minded Christians. We have too many double-minded Christians. He said, say it again. We have what I call AM Christians and FM Christians. They just keep switching channels on God. On Sunday, they come to church and they're FM Christians. They tune into the Kingdom Broadcasting Network. And man, they are dialed in. They're lifting their hands. They're worshiping the Lord. They're listening to the message. They're, they're wanting to take it in like a sponge. But then come Monday, or sometimes as early as Sunday afternoon, you know, they switch the dial over to AM, FM rather, or AM rather. And now they're on the secular network, getting all their information, being informed by the human wisdom of this world. Friends, our citizenship is in heaven, and we just happen to be part-time residents down here. So we have to start thinking like kingdom citizens and voting like kingdom citizens and acting like kingdom citizens because this is not our home. And we should live our lives that way. This is not our home. See, God has a problem. Here's God's problem. He has too many Benedict Arnolds. You know, turncoats. A turncoat is somebody who leaves where their loyalty ought to be and works for the wrong team. Now, it's okay to be a, Repu a Republican as long as your ultimate allegiance isn't there. It's okay to be a Democrat, I guess. I mean, the Democrat party today isn't what it was 30 years ago. I promise you that. Read their platform. But if you want to call yourself a Democrat, that's okay, just as long as your ultimate allegiance isn't there. Why? Because you belong to another kingdom with another king. Even worse, God has some Benedict Arnold churches now. Because now we have entire churches who have gone rogue and they've compromised and walked away from God's standard on, on the issues of life and the protection of the unborn. They've walked away from God's definition in his word of marriage. They've walked away from God's definition of identity. And pastors now leave the word of God closed and they say, well, I think, or here's how I feel. Or this is my perspective. Well, preacher boy, your earthly perspective doesn't matter because we are citizens of heaven. This is not our home. And friends, listen to me, please. Until you and I get that radicalized kind of perspective, we will not see the supernatural power of God enter into the natural in order to, to fix the chaos and the disorder. In Judges chapter 8, the people called upon a man named Gideon, and they said, we want you to be our political leader. And Gideon said, you better inquire of the Lord about that, because the Lord ought to be your leader. And the mess that we find ourselves in today as a nation and as a church is because we have left the Lord out of the issues. We've called them political and said, God doesn't care about that. And it is the church's job to bring God back into it. Lovingly, kindly, appropriately, but we must do it. We must do it. And then Paul wraps up his discord. I, I just love this. In verse 20, he says, and we eagerly await a savior from there. 
the Lord Jesus Christ. Look this way. You know that you are a kingdom citizen when you have placed Jesus Christ in his proper position. Paul says he's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus made it plain in Matthew 28 when he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Interpretation, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge of everything, but many Christians don't believe that. So their focus is off. They believe government's in charge, or a president is in charge, or a system is in charge. No, Jesus is in charge of heaven and earth. I was preaching at a men's conference, and Pastor Keith Kraft, some of you know him, he's spoken at our church. Uh, he showed me a passage that rocked my world. And I said, thank you, Pastor Keith. That's mine now for my message on Sunday. And this is what he said. He said that Paul makes this point in Ephesians 1, that everything in all of history and currently is summarized in Christ. Now think about that. Verse 10 says, he set it all out before us in Christ, a long range plan. This is God in which everything will be brought together and summarized in Christ. Everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth. And then here's the exciting part. Verse 22, all this energy issues or emanates from Christ. Don't miss this. God raised him from death and set him on the throne in deep heaven, in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments. No name and no power except from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, this, is, this bless me, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks. Did you hear that? The church is Christ's body in which he speaks to the world and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. I don't think you caught that. God decides what he's going to do in a nation and in all nations based on what the church does. So if we don't fix the church house, we can forget about the White House. If we don't fix the church house, forget about the House of Congress. Why? Because God is working through the church to deal with the principalities and the powers and the authorities in this culture. It's not going to happen unless the church wakes up. So come on, church. It's time to wake up. It's time to understand why we're here. Jesus said in Luke 22, verse 29, 29, just as my Father has given me a kingdom, I also give you a kingdom. In other words, I've given you a kingdom. I want you to advance on it. I want you to move it forward. I don't want you to be passive. I'm not talking about physical violence or being mean. But he says, I want you to be aggressive. Move the thing forward. So what's happened is we complain about schools falling apart when passive Christians walk away. We complain about injustice in the womb, these precious little babies, when Christians don't stand up for justice. What I'm saying is this is our time to be aggressive, kind and loving, but also aggressive. There should be no passivity in the heart and the mind of a believer. I read this week that Spain developed a strategy in war known as the fifth colonist. One year before they would invade a country, they would send people in to the country, their citizens, to be part of the culture. So they would send doctors in early to set up shop. They would send lawyers in early to set up shop. They'd send families in early to set up shop. They would send teachers in to teach to prepare for the invasion. And they were called fifth columnists because Spain marched in four columns. But now they had a fifth column of saboteurs who would go in early and sit up shop and prepare for the big invasion. 
Well, guess what, church? There is a big invasion coming to this earth because Jesus Christ is coming back, but he has some fifth columnists already here. That's you, that's me, that's my family, that's your family, that is our church. And he wants us to prepare for the big invasion when he returns to earth and sets up his 1,000 year millennial reign. I wanna ask you a question, are you in the game? Are you setting it up? Or have you become so attached to the culture that you've lost sight of your true citizenship? That you are a part of another kingdom. Now the Arizona Cardinals have different kinds of fans. They have casual fans. They may or may not watch the game. They, they, they say that that's their favorite team, but if the game's a blowout or whatever, they just turn the channel, move on. Just casual fans. Then they have committed fans. These are the fans who are gonna watch every game on television. They're gonna read the articles the next day, know some of the players. Uh, they're committed fans. But then they have some fanatical fans. These are the season ticket holders. Come rain or shine, man, they are gonna be at that game cheering on the Arizona Cardinals. They're gonna read about the Cardinals. They're gonna talk about the Cardinals because they are fanatics and they are all in. Well, God has different kinds of followers. He has casual followers. They go to church sometimes. When they're not sleeping at Bedside Baptist or Mattress Methodist. <laughs> and when they come to church, they're not engaged. They're not really worshiping the Lord. It's, it's more entertainment to them. And they can just kind of yawn off during the message or look at their phones because they're just casual followers. Then God has some committed followers. And indeed, these are people who are gonna make church most of the time. Okay, it's, it's gonna be their priority. And these are people who, who have a Bible and carry it with them maybe, and they know a little bit about the Bible, and they're gonna pray for their meals before their meals, and they're gonna pray before they lay down at night because they, they are committed to Christ. They would say they're a committed follower. But then God has some fanatical followers. I'm talking committed disciples. Thoughts of Jesus fill their mind. It's Jesus in the morning and Jesus at noontime and Jesus when the sun goes down. It's Jesus during times that are good and they're rejoicing and it's still Jesus even when there are tears rolling down their face because their life is Jesus. They are all in for Jesus. They don't care about what other people say about their team. They don't care about what culture says, about who they are following. They are just gonna be unmistakable, unapologetic, unashamed followers of Jesus. Where are you? Luke, what does this have to do with our series called The Bible and the Ballot? Because Jesus is not on the ballot. Oh yes, he is. Jesus' name is always on the ballot because remember, you are a kingdom citizen. This is not your home. So you are a kingdom independent, which means that Jesus not only goes with you into the voting booth, but he goes with you after the election is over, even if your candidate of choice does not win. And if you're a kingdom independent, it means that sometimes the Republicans are gonna like me and sometimes the Republicans are not gonna like me. And sometimes, more often, the Democrats aren't gonna like me. And sometimes they will like me. Because I'm, I'm voting kingdom. Kingdom values, biblical values. You can't lose that way. So final question. <clears throat> what are you gonna do? What are you going to do with this message? Are you gonna say, powerful thought, Luke, and then go out and just eat pizza and forget about it? Or are you gonna take your stand? Or are you gonna just play church? Come to church because it's Sunday. Or are you going to take a stand because you now understand, you're not ignorant now, that you are not just here for yourself, but you are here as a kingdom representative. You are here to suck heaven down to this earth and bring heaven's perspective to every issue. 
to the chaos. Am I, gonna, am I just gonna show up on Sunday and preach because it's Sunday? Collect a paycheck and just go play golf all day? What am I going to do? Or am I gonna challenge this flock to take their stand with the right spirit, but with clarity and boldness that this is God's perspective on everything and every decision? You know, one of the reasons why so many Jews were murdered during the Holocaust, Hitler's reign, is because the church was silent. Now don't miss this. Hitler, in so many words, made a deal with the preachers. Hitler said, I tell you what, you stay out of policy, you stay out of politics and government, out of the issues culturally, and just tend to the flock. Just tend to the souls of your people. And I'll leave you alone if you'll just kind of leave us alone. A pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer stood up and said, oh no, it's not how we roll in our church. We're gonna stand idly by and watch a madman massacre innocent Jewish people. I'm not gonna stand idly by and watch as the government passes evil laws in the culture and Hitler's regime killed this pastor. But the truth is, Hitler had the church so anesthetized and secularized and terrified that as these trains would go by certain churches, this broke my heart when I read this, they would travel by these churches and the people would be in their churches singing hymns. And while they were singing these hymns, they could hear the screeches and the shrieks and the cries of Jewish people crying out, help us, please somebody help us, save us. And one woman was asked, asked what, did, what did you do when you were singing those hymns in the church and you heard men, women and children crying out to be saved, what did you do? She said, we just sang a little louder. We just turned the volume up and sang a little louder. I want to tell you, as your pastor, I can't live with myself to operate that way. Too many Christians and too many churches are singing a little louder while people are dying and going to hell. People's lives in this nation are being destroyed by evil and unrighteousness and the church just sits idly by and sings a little louder, sing a little longer, preach a little longer without challenging the people to be citizens of heaven made by God to invade the culture with the worldview of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. So just to bring this down to where you and I live and make this practical, some of you are here for the first time. Welcome to Dream City Church, amen. I wanna tell you, our church is a love boat and a battleship. We can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can rescue people and heal people and love people while taking our stand for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we gotta do. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Four quick things. These are things that all of us can do if we want to be kingdom citizens. Are you ready? Number one, make it known publicly this week that you are a citizen of heaven. Make it known to somebody with the right heart and spirit, but you must say to someone, my first allegiance in this world is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't say just God, that's vague. Say the Lord Jesus Christ. Now they know who you're talking about. Make it public. Number two, make a move from being a good churchgoer to engaging the culture and bringing a heaven kingdom perspective into your sphere of influence. Parents, you gotta get involved in your kid's school. You gotta make sure you understand what they are required to read by their teacher. The school doesn't own your kids. You own your kids. God owns your kids. You loan them to them for a few hours every single day. And parent, you are responsible for the education of your child. 
So when they bring this LBGT doctrine and normalize it to your kid, you got to stand up and say, no, this is wrong. This is what the Word of God says. And because we're kingdom people, that's our perspective. When they bring the evolution garbage into your child's mind, you got to combat that with the Word of God. And say, no, this is the kingdom perspective. This is what the Word of God says. Go to city council meetings to hear what's happening in your community. And if they're promoting evil practices, then lead the charge to overturn the policy. When police officers do it well, and they do it well 99.9% .9 of the time, but in those moments when they're not doing it well, stand up and say, this is wrong too. Because you're not Republican or Democrat. You are a kingdom mind on this thing. And we have to be driven by a kingdom mindset. Number three, make sure that you vote. Any Christian who doesn't vote is not taking their Christianity seriously. We cannot complain about our leaders unless Christians get involved and vote. Register today as you leave. And then finally, here's the last one. We're gonna close. I'm gonna ask you as your pastor to make a renewed commitment to your church. We just learned from the Bible that not, God does nothing except through the church. The church is the body of Christ. That's how he moves in culture. So why would you spend all your time focusing on politics when the change comes to the church? Go ahead and vote. Yeah, we need to vote and all that. But it's the church. Friends, look at me. There, there is no salvation in politics. We've been acting as though politics is the savior. Well, if we get this person in and get that person out. No, what we have to understand is if God is not postured properly, it doesn't matter who you elect. It is either the absence or the presence of God in the environment that brings either chaos or order. And the more we push God out of our nation, the more secular we have become, the less we see God moving in our midst. And the less we see God moving, the more chaos we're going to have to deal with. So church, look at me. It's time for us to... <laughs> shake, shake ourselves up. Wake up. Get up. So that we can see what God is able to do through a church of people who understand where our true citizenship lies. It's time to wake up and get up and build God's kingdom. I'm asking for a fresh commitment, a fresh commitment to the church from all of us. I'm talking about your time, talents, and your treasures. So we can be equipped to take up more ground in our culture. And when you, when you finally choose a church, don't church choose a, a little pastor who wants to be a rock star. You know, don't, church, don't choose a pastor who just wants to be cultural. He says nothing from the pulpit that affects your living in the world. The job of the church is to equip its people to invade the culture. So doctors are not just doctors. They are God's representative to the doctors. And lawyers are not just lawyers. They are God's representative in the judicial system so that the jury and judge can see what God looks like. And teachers are not just teachers. But they are God's representatives in the school system so that students can see what God looks like when he teaches. And business people are not just building their empire. They're doing it as God's representative in the kingdom so that business people can look at what, how God does things when the deal is done right. And homemakers are not just homemakers, but they're God's representatives in the home to bring a godly culture to the home. And men are not just men. They are God's representatives of what a man is and how he acts and how he treats his wife and how he raises his kids. We need God's people to invade the culture. What we are trying to do, friends, is create kingdom people who are citizens of heaven, who invade the culture and not just mimic the culture. As you stand to your feet, I'm gonna ask no one, please leave this place until the final blessing is done today. I heard a story this week about 
a man who was taking his shoes to the shoe smith or the shoe shop. And the shoe shop closed at five o'clock and the man got there at 5.05. And he jumped out of his car with the shoes and ran up and he saw the, the business owner in the shop, but the close sign was flashing. And so the man knocked on his window and he said, please, I, I need some help with my shoes. Well, the owner came to the door and opened the door and said, come on in. And he began to take care of his shoes. And, and, and the man said to the owner, I, I noticed something. I noticed there's no cars in the parking lot. By now, I thought maybe your car would be out there and you'd be ready to go home. And the owner of the shop said, well, I am home. What do you mean you're home? And he pointed at some stairs and he said, see those stairs over there? After work, I climbed those stairs and that's where I live, right above the shop. He said, I, I live up there, but I work down here. I live up there, but I work down here. Friends, let God challenge us today to be, be, be people who live up there in the heavenlies, but we work for him down here as representatives of the king. Can you say amen to that? Now. I'm gonna close, I'm gonna close, but I want you all to know that I, I battled, I had every, seems like every demon in hell fighting me this week. I've been physically sick now three times in the last two months for an extended period of time. I, I, I'm not a sickly person, but something kind of tells me that the enemy kind of fights at us when he, when he knows we're bringing challenging messages like this that's gonna move people to more of a kingdom mindset. And so this week, I, I was sicker than a dog Monday and Tuesday. I limped in here Wednesday night to church. I probably infected a lot of you. I'm sorry, very, very much sorry about that. But my dad has taught me, you don't, you don't call in, you crawl in. So when the, when the doors are open, I'm gonna be here if I'm in town. And then I was sick on Thursday. I got up early Friday, flew in an airplane out there, sat through the conference for the first couple hours, blowing my nose, plugging my nose, trying to open my ears, all that, every trick in the book. And man, I got up there and preached my heart out and God touched it and blessed it, but I just kind of felt like, man, that wasn't my best. Then I had to turn the page quickly and prepare this message, finish it up. I, when I got up Saturday morning, caught the seven o'clock flight out of Dallas and flew back. I studied for two and a half hours straight on the flight. Got the flight, drove down to church about 10 o'clock. Studied from 10 to two in the afternoon. I'm just still, still not feeling it in my spirit. I'm like, God, I, I think this is all wrong. I, I just, I couldn't get a breakthrough. Until this morning at 9 a.m., when I shared the word of God. See, there was resistance from the enemy in sharing this message, but at nine o'clock, the altars were full of people saying, I don't want to be a person of earthly thinking. I wanna be a, a heavenly citizen in my thinking. We don't have space today for everyone to come forward, but I know your hearts are touched today. How many would simply say, Pastor Luke, what you said today is a big perspective shift for me, but I know it is the truth. And I don't wanna continue living my life by human wisdom. I wanna live my life as a representative of the kingdom of God on this earth. I wanna be part of that fifth columnist setting up for the great return of Jesus Christ. If that's you, if God's touched your heart today, raise your hand, I wanna pray for you all across this place. Father, you've seen the hands of people lifted right now all across this place. Thank you, Lord, for a church who gets it that they understand that our lives, as you said, are no longer our own. We've been bought with a price. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not our kingdom, it's your kingdom. And Father, we want to represent you well. We wanna make a difference in this world with regard to the people we elect in the elections, with regard to our family who are far from God, 
we ask you, God, to use our lives. Father, we repent right now. We say we are sorry for getting sidetracked, Lord, and getting disillusioned and licking our wounds when you called us to advance the kingdom. So we just repent. Just say, God, I'm sorry that that's been my posture. But here, from here on out, I'm going to advance your kingdom. I'm going to represent you on every single issue that I deal with in my life. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you for what you've done today. Let us leave this place with our shoulders back, with our head held high, because we are children of the King. That's our perspective, and we're going to represent our King in Jesus' name. And everybody said today, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a great clap offering.